Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to this beautiful history of Colorado place. Thank you, Sean, for having us here like every month or so. On this strange winter day, it started with this snow that it was like the end of the, the world and then sun came out and beautiful Colorado day. So it, interesting, a little bit cold. But, and we are here together uh, for a uh, special presentation on the role of maps on electoral re re redistricting, which is a very timely topic. Um, and we're going to we're going to talk about this in a moment for for the introduction. We're going to have Naomi Heiser introducing our speaker. But let me pause here because this happens to be the very last time that Naomi Heiser is going to introduce our speaker and on her role of, of, uh, of program director of the Rocky Mountain Map Society. So I would like to take the opportunity to thank Naomi for the uh, impressive work that she has uh, done on the last five years. She has brought and, and, and injected uh, the, the society with new speakers, new topics. It has been an incredible five-year ride. I really hate to see you go, Naomi. I may convince you to stay, um, <laughs> but I don't know. Pa uh, the Rocky Mountain Map Society doesn't have any para or anything like this, so there's no retirement. Um, <laughs> but uh, I would really like to take the opportunity for everybody to give Naomi a big round of applause in person and in Zoom for all the work that she has done in the last five years. <laughs> Thank you so much. And she'll still be there and call and see you. And probably she will be sending us some speakers every once in a while. We'll see. Uh, so Naomi, why don't you come here and, and address the crowd for the last time and introduce our speaker. Thank you. Sorry for making you feel you had to convince me. <laughs> um, yeah, so tonight is my last Rocky Mountain Map Society program manager night. It's been five wonderful years. Um, I've worked with so many enthusiastic MAP community members to find speakers of all different kinds for our programs. And I thank everyone for this opportunity um, to meet all these incredible people who just know so much about maps and especially historical maps. Um, you've given me a wealth of knowledge that I can take into my own job as a map curator at CU. Um, it's really helped me um, to make my job better and to reach out to other people. Um, I really appreciate it. And I will still be around to compile our newsletter. So when you see the newsletter, if you have any questions about anything you see there, just reach out to me. I'm happy to answer them. Um, our programming will be done now by a committee of board members. Um, one of them is here, Wes Brown. Um, we have three other board members who will be on this committee doing programming. And hopefully you'll hear from them in the newsletter soon about um, how you can reach them with your ideas for new speakers. So um, upcoming programs in March, we have our own Don McGurk, who's going to come to town, I think from Kansas, right, um, to speak on the topic, Is This North America? And it's in reference to how the earliest world maps of the early 16th century appear to depict the eastern coast of North America decades before its documented exploration, and he has a theory about that. So stay tuned. That's going to be interesting. Um, in April, we have a break because then in May, we have May Map Month, which is a really exciting month of four talks, four weeks in a row. And this year the theme is persuasive maps. So you'll look forward to seeing more information about that soon. So um, tonight we have a very different type of talk than we usually have or have had for the last um, number of months. It's about current mapping in Colorado that aims to reform the process of redistricting so that all residents are represented democratically. And we'll learn about the role that maps play in redistricting. Tonight, we have Rebecca Theobald, who is Associate Research Professor in Geography and Environmental Studies Department at UC Colorado Springs. She directs GeoCivics, um, which addresses electoral redistricting and emphasizing the role that geospatial technology plays in drawing districts. From 2008 to 2018, she served as coordinator of Colorado Geographic Alliance, which is part of the National Geographic's Network of Alliances for Geographic Education. I met Rebecca years ago when we did a really fun exercise on the giant map of Colorado, which is about as big as where everyone is sitting here. Um, we have a copy at our library and we use it with kids a lot and she taught us how to do that, which was really fun. So welcome, Rebecca. I'm really delighted to be here with you to uh, talk about electoral redistricting processes and the role of maps in representation. 
According to its website, the Rocky Mountain Map Society is, quote, dedicated to the study and appreciation of maps and other items of cartographic interest. And I am grateful that there are many people across the country continuing discussions about the substantive, multi-layered, and often beautiful descriptions of the earth and other places. This presentation will examine redistricting in the United States within the context of global approaches to geographic representation, current democracy reform projects in the United States, and manipulation of districts to maintain power. In Colgrove v. Green, which determined that a remedy for unfairness in districting was a political issue and a matter for the state legislature, in this case in Illinois, Justice Frankfurter concluded, the Constitution has left the performance of many duties in our governmental scheme to depend on the vigilance of the people in exercising their political rights. Vigilance is the key word here. It is up to the people. Geocivics originated as a project at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs to support secondary teachers and higher education instructors in teaching about electoral redistricting from a geographic perspective with an emphasis on the importance of geospatial technology tools. If you don't know how to create a map, you may be mapped into a district without your knowledge. Integration of geography with other subjects, including history, civics, economics, and science is a key component of this project. Utilizing geography to teach apportionment, redistricting, and gerrymandering from a spatial perspective allows participants to gain a greater and deeper understanding of the content and how to integrate that knowledge into daily life. Geographic thinking is not simply considering where things are, but also why things are where they are. Most community members do not invest time to learn about the redistricting process unless they perceive their boundaries as unfair. If students are not learning the basics of how representatives are chosen, they are not able to make good decisions about governance for the country. Our one opportunity in the United States to provide a foundation on redistricting is to teach the topic during civics classes in secondary school. Recall that this discussion is about sending people to deliberative bodies. Representatives in local, state, and federal government set the rules by which society functions. In ways large and small, these representatives affect all aspects of our civic process, taxes, food safety, environmental protections, community security, and public education. In preparation for drawing electoral district lines or for analyzing existing maps, it is important to understand, one, how the population of the state has shifted over time, two, how the redistricting criteria are prioritized and reflected on the electoral district map, three, how you describe your community verbally and visually, and four, how you might draw congressional and legislative districts to reflect your priorities. The more preparation and thought, the better the discussion. No one can have everything they want reflected in a map. And so it is especially important to identify where you are willing to compromise. One neglected aspect in discussions about the redistricting process is that political geographers in other countries find the United States an outlier, with most democracies having clear processes preventing undue influence from partisans. Here, politicians draw the maps or influence them to a significant degree, or rather they direct staff members to create maps based on their ideas. In contrast, most other countries employ professional non-political experts who redraw maps at regular intervals based on new data or changing demographics. As with any structure, it is how the rules are developed and interpreted that determines whether the process and outcome is perceived as fair by those affected. In Japan, as elsewhere, Quote, the legitimacy of the authority conferred upon politicians is contingent on the fairness of the electoral map. Representation requires constant vigilance. Boundary commissions in England have recently worked to correct the size of constituencies with some complaints that the results favor the current ruling party. Japan too recently redrew its map with some provinces losing representation similar to the reapportionment decisions in the United States. Australia redistributes its population using nonpartisan electoral commissions with the Commonwealth Electoral, Electoral Act 
stipulating consideration of, quote, means of communication and travel, physical features and area, and existing electorate boundaries. These considerations tend to produce compact electorates in Australia, which follow natural or artificial boundaries such as rivers and major roads, unquote. Early in the history of the American Republic, manipulation of voting districts was used to funnel particular parties into power. Massachusetts Governor Elbridge Gerry signed a bill to minimize Federalist votes by stringing together a district that a cartoonist transformed into a salamander and gerrymander entered the political lexicon. Quote, in 1812, only 11 Federalist legislators were elected in Massachusetts to 29 Republicans, although Federalists got 51,766 popular votes and the Republicans 50,164. This looked like cheating to most voters, wrote Butterfield in 1976. What is common among other democracies is that almost all news coverage or scholarly investigations about redistricting note, well, we might have some challenges with how our lines are drawn, but it's not as bad as in the United States. I would argue that this is not really how we want our political processes to be highlighted. Partisan maps, usually the result of political influence on cartography, result in much more litigation in the United States than in other countries. In these states, communities have been cracked and packed to produce uh, particular electoral outcomes. While no system is perfect, I can't help think of all the time and effort that could go into other pursuits to improve the community if people did not have to collect demographic data, analyze and critique maps, and file lawsuits when representation appears to be unfair. If those tasks sound like fun to you, then definitely find the people in your community who are working on fair redistricting and join their team. Countless individuals across the country have for decades worked to establish fair legislative representation through geographic districts that democracies have determined is a reasonable way to choose people to be part of a representative body. For over 200 years in the United States, communities and individuals have identified and resolved issues such as malapportionment or unequal population representation, exclusion of populations based on certain criteria, conflict between rural and urban populations, and gerrymandering based on race and party. In her book, The History of America in 100 Maps, Susan Shulton uses North Carolina as an example of where representation has been affected by poll taxes and tests, malapportionment and gerrymandering. She illustrates that just a small change using geospatial technology tools can result in a shift of voters to increase or decrease a particular party member being elected and highlights the problem of managing electoral districts based on multiple criteria. Quote, the dilemma is striking. Concentrating racial minorities advance their representation but also weaken their party elsewhere. Because African-Americans tended to vote Democrat, the effort to create secure majority minority districts unintentionally made the surrounding districts more Republican. In part, the problem lies with representative democracy, which hinges on geography. What constitutes a coherent constituency and how are lines to be fairly drawn, unquote. Going forward, let us keep these terms in mind. Electoral maps that are blatantly unfair lead to as the Japanese styled it, quote, a lack of legitimacy of authority being conferred upon politicians, unquote. What is the best process to arrive at maps that provide the representation for the most people? Let us turn to some of the reforms being explored across the country. While this ugly Jerry font highlights multiple manipulated districts, Many people involved in democracy reform projects in the United States are engaged in working to create fair maps. We do appreciate the opportunity to face these challenges with humor. A good test for a gerrymandered district is to determine whether you could identify the cardinal directions for these particular districts. Because we know maps are central to electing people to legislative assemblies and because gerrymandering is a term people have heard, we often grasp at redistricting as a way to address imbalances. However, for those less cartographically inclined, there are groups dedicated to open primaries, which provide some structure for people not registered for e either major party to vote prior to the general election. Alternative voting methods, 
uh, to our first past the post system where the person with the most votes wins, such as ranked choice voting or approval voting. Public financing of political campaigns. I would also advocate for shorter campaign cycles. Uh, reform of the electoral college and random constituency. This is where individuals are assigned to a member of the House of Representatives when they reach voting age and continue to vote for that seat throughout their lives, no matter where they live. This does away with territorial constituencies. I have to say this is not particularly um, prevalent in conversation, but I did want to bring it to your uh, attention. And we need to remember that all these intersect with trends in the United States, such as geographic polarization of electoral outcomes and rise of regional polarization as described by David Hopkins in 2017. Redistricting is just one approach to democracy reform, but it is the one we will focus on today. So let us return to constructing an electoral district map, which requires moving from census data to apportionment, to rules, to understanding communities, to a map, to electing the representatives. I will assume some familiarity with the American federal system and elections. Just as a reminder, uh, senators are elected geographically by whole states. Electoral redistricting for the House of Representatives takes place after the decennial census in, in the United States. Population data provide the basis for how many people should be grouped in each geographic area while laws and regulations guide the decisions made by the people designated to draw lines. In a democracy, representation is the most important aspect of the governance process. The description of how the House of Representatives, the federal governing body closest to the electorate is chosen, is located in the second section of the first article of the Constitution. Quote, the House of Representatives shall be composed of members chosen every second year by the people of the several states. Representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union according to their respective numbers." Unquote. When the people consider themselves fairly represented, they are more inclined to engage with government at multiple levels. How to allocate the seats in the House of Representatives has been of significant discussion since the Constitutional Convention. Apportionment among the 50 states of the 435 seats in the House of Representatives is the first step in the electoral redistricting process. After several iterations, we use the method of equal proportion, where each of the 50 states is given one seat. The next, or 51st seat, goes to the state with the highest population as defined by the census and continues until all 435 seats have been assigned to a state. Colorado was apportioned an eighth seat in the House, United States House of Representatives after the 2020 census count. Understanding the history, geography, and economics of the state, as well as how the population has evolved, helps create a robust electoral district map. One way to explore these details is to examine the population change over time. GeoCivics offers an opportunity for each state to explore the evolution of the 15 largest cities in different time periods using National Geographic giant maps or uh, um, driving maps. And we have an illustration of that back on the table. The most important aspect of the discussion for cartographers and members of the public is understanding traditional redistricting principles and the state's criteria. Electoral redistricting maps reflect the characteristics the cartographers are instructed to include. So the description of the rules used to guide the map makers is the lodestone of this process. Transparency in using those guidelines to draw maps is also key to fair representation. But if you take nothing else away from this conversation, please take time to examine the statutes in your area regarding geographic representation city, county, state, and federal jurisdictions all have their own requirements, although the foundation must be met for each equal population and minorities must not be prevented from electing a candidate of their choice. Across the country, state legislatures and independent redistricting commissions must adhere to their state's guidelines for drawing electoral districts. Colorado passed amendments Y and Z in 2018 creating two 12 member commissions to form districts for Colorado's United States House seats and the Colorado General Assembly. Citizen commissions are one way to approach reforming the redistricting process. 
The intent of amendments Y and Z was to decrease the influence of partisan politics, avoid splitting existing political subdivisions, create competitive districts and provide for public participation in the process. Thanks to an educational group, Draw the Lines PA, an interactive exercise, Flashes of Insight, enables conversation about what should be identified in a map. States set their own guidelines, but traditional redistricting criteria, such as contiguity, maintaining political boundaries, as well as the Voting Rights Act, informs the process. One factor, communities of interest, may include age, ethnic, cultural, economic, neighborhood, trade area, geographic, and demographic factors. While the United States does not have a proportional representation system, imbalance of legislators in one direction or another, not reflected in the population, is perceived as unfair. Working with the state's redistricting criteria, members of the redistricting commissions establish priorities to create maps. Whether those maps are fair depends on interpretation, no matter the data. Mathematicians such as Moon Duchin, pictured here, have contributed significantly to the redistricting conversation, but their analyses have not yet penetrated many communities that rely on manipulated maps to manage voting options. Working with the state's redistricting criteria, the notable map collections from Dave's redistricting app allow us to visualize what prioritizing different criteria means for different jurisdictions and different locations. These maps from Ohio demonstrate the variety of maps that meet requirements, yet provide very different paths to representation. Remember, what you prioritize ends up on the map. An important task for members of the public is to describe their community. Representable.org offers an excellent approach to this task. Here's an example illustrating downtown Colorado Springs. These open source online tools present people with the chance to communicate what they want others to know about their locations using words and maps, as there is no possible way for a dozen people to gain a sense of the characteristics of every place in the state. So we've collected census data, examined the rules and learned about communities and their characteristics. We return to the heart of the redistricting process, which is drawing maps. Most governments use robust for-profit mapping platforms, particularly if they are already integrated into their information technology departments. In the past, the cost of these programs was a huge barrier for public participation in mapping. However, in the last decade, many universities and nonprofit organizations have provided open source software and geospatial technology tools to enable anyone with a computer to undertake this task. In the past, uh, while not everyone will use these tools to prepare themselves to discuss mapping options, making the public aware of their existence will demonstrate the opportunity for informed engagement. If you draw your community one way and your neighbor draws it another, could you work together to find places where you agree? By drawing a map and defending your choices, as in the description of this map proposed by the Colorado Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, you have the responsibility to prepare to debate with others who have made different decisions. Redistricting discussions could serve as a standard for ways to have more reasonable discourse. In spite of the limitations of the pandemic, the Colorado Independent Redistricting Commissions benefited from online and in-person public comments, analysis from experts and maps created by people across the state. Public hearings in each congressional district were held over the course of the commission's work. While people might be disappointed in the final map, the public discussions enabled pros and cons to be thoughtfully considered with deliberations made under transparent conditions. Citizen redistricting commissions are a key approach to obtaining fair maps. Here is another set of maps from Dave's redistricting notable maps collection. It is possible to model reasonable discussions using maps as a framework. During a time of political polarization, mass demonstrations, civil unrest, and intemperate statements by people in all facets of public life, passionate, factual, and polite defense of one's position as part of a civic discussion seems challenging. As with these students in Illinois, once you make a map, you have a much better idea of how the process works and what questions to ask. So we have explored approaches leading to creation of maps, but much more often community members will be examining maps that have been proposed or approved. 
So what tools are available to assess those? Not surprisingly, the courts play a role in this process. Early concerns about redistricting usually did not make their way through the appeals process and were decided at the state level. For much of the 19th and 20th centuries, deciding who would represent what geographic area or even how to describe that geographic area was left up to state legislatures. But as with issues such as school segregation and housing discrimination, eventually the unequal treatment of so many people in the country required the courts to become involved in the discussion reluctantly. These cases confirmed that malapportionment would not be permitted at the state or federal level. The challenge now is that even a one vote deviation, which might make practical sense, could trigger litigation. Remember, compared to other democracies, the United States experiences significantly more legal actions around redistricting. Some cases address key issues about fairness. The last quarter of the 20th century found the United States Supreme Court reviewing voting rights cases primarily based on race. More recent cases carry issues of political partisanship. In the most recent term, decisions in June of 2023 found, quote, the Constitution's elections clause does not vest exclusive and independent authority in state legislatures to set the rules regarding federal elections in Moore v. Harper. And Merrill v. Mulligan, quote, affirmed the district court's determination that plaintiffs demonstrated a reasonable likelihood of success on their claim that Alabama's 2021 redistricting plan violated Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, leading to a redrawn congressional map. Let's look at the final topic for today, manipulation of districts to maintain power. These maps from the historical atlas of state power in Congress 1790 to 1990 by Martis and Elms provide insight into changes from the census in 1900 to 1910. This was the last time that seats were added with the number of members in the House of Representatives fixed at 435 seats in 1911. These maps demonstrate the continuing shift of political power from the Northeast to the Southwest. While those in power generally work hard to keep themselves there, the most familiar systematic infringement on voting rights in the United States was found in the South following Reconstruction, when African American citizens were denied the right to vote based on race, masked by poll taxes, literacy te tests, and violence. In 1965, the Voting Rights Act was passed by the Congress and signed by President Johnson, with its primary objective being the enforcement of the 15th Amendment of the Constitution, quote, no voting qualification or prerequisite to voting or standard practice or procedure shall be imposed or applied by any state or political subdivision to deny or abridge the right of any citizen of the United States to, to vote on account of race or color. Practice and procedure would include the process of redrawing electoral dis districts for federal, state, and local offices. However, redistricting or not has been a way to maintain power when people moved to the cities, those in the rural areas realized that they were going to have some of their clout decreased. They solved this problem by not drawing new lines, sometimes for six decades, um, with similar results for those who were in the majority racially or ethnically, which might mean something different in different parts of the country. Although almost always the white male voter ended up with more decision-making power. The 118th Congress, elected in November of 2022, can be described as the most diverse in the history of the Republic. However, there are still significant disparities in representation when looking strictly at racial and ethnic diversity. The Pew Research Center reports that non-Hispanic white Americans account for 75% of voting members in the current Congress, considerably more than their 59% share of the U.S. population. The number of women in Congress is at an all-time high, with 28% of representatives and senators female, while the number of members with military experience is at an all-time low. Just to note that maps are usually uh, explanatory, but occasionally charts and graphs can be useful in interpreting information. There is visual change among who becomes a leader at the state and federal levels, but many voters still feel that their voices are not heard meaning that issues related to representation are still relevant. 
imagine the map showing the first most prevalent ethnicity instead of what we have, which is the second most prevalent race or ethnicity. Um, it would be almost all orange, um, except for California, Hawaii, New Mexico, and the District of Columbia. This map is somewhat more instructive about the diversity across the country. Since the Census Bureau declared the end of the frontier in 1890, issues related to urbanization have been a challenge to the structure of the country, including for electoral representation. For 60 years, rural areas were overrepresented relative to their population. During the 1972 redistricting process, which came after the landmark decisions and legislation of the 1960s and the incorporation of the 1970 census data, map drawers often protected incumbents while equalizing district population to reflect the guideline of one person, one vote. We had equal population districts, but they were still dependent on traditional information. There is no magic approach to drawing districts, which is why the most important aspect of this work must be transparency. Anyone who has taken a cartography course has been pushed to provide metadata, which is information about a publication as compared with the content of the publication. We need to have explanations about the maps that are being presented. Recently, the county commission districts in El Paso County, Colorado, where Colorado Springs is the largest municipality, underwent redistricting. The current county commissioners appointed themselves as the redistricting commission. And although a new state law required that the process be transparent and public comments be incorporated into the decision-making, this one important leg of the stool, independent commissioners was absent. The staff for the redistricting commission primarily from the county clerk and recorder's office, dutifully presented a variety of maps and statistics about how they had moved X number of precincts to a particular district. But the data really didn't tell the whole story. This is the new district map. You can see the urban area in the center western portion of the county. As a result of citizen comments, there is now a district that does not divide the southeastern portion of the county where minorities constitute 45% or more of the populations in the precincts. It will be interesting to see how the election for these commissioners turns out in the fall of 2024. In contrast, this is a proposed map by a citizen of the county. Mr. Perez also happens also to have participated on the City of Colorado Springs Redistricting Commission, as well as served as chair of the Legislative Independent Redistricting Commission for the state. So he's not new to the conversation. However, he was using the accessible software uh, available to everyone else in the community. What I found to be the most remarkable part of his map was actually the explanation which details why particular neighborhoods or features were grouped together. We never had that much detail written down from the El Paso County officials, with more focus on election results and percentage of precinct moves. This is an example of transparency as part of the map making process. You could have a conversation with Mr. Perez about what choices he made. That's, that's what you want to get to, and that's what we very rarely have an opportunity to do when we are making maps. What we usually see is analysis after the fact. A great many free tools exist to help one ask questions about whether a map provides fair representation. One way to assess maps quickly is to analyze whether they allow fewer than 50% of voters to elect a majority or a supermajority. Analysis usually requires significant investment of time and math. Sam Wong and his team at the Princeton Gerrymandering Project recently shared their analyses of Wisconsin legislative plans, explaining that one could evaluate the mean median difference, which is the difference in partisanship between the median district and the statewide average. But sometimes you do not need extensive data to identify manipulation. In the map on the left, the Davidson County and the metropolitan area of Nashville have been divided into three congressional districts. On the right, the power of Salt Lake City residents has been diluted by combining parts of rural and urban areas. This map demonstrates similar cracking in Fayetteville, Fort Liberty, previously Fort Bragg, community in North Carolina. 
And this tool assesses uh, maps for partisan fairness, competitiveness, and geographic features. So you don't have to do the math. You can ask someone else to do it for you. Ohio does not fare particularly well. Um, and uh, they also offer um, multiple maps. Uh, multiple maps mean multiple comparisons, such as were recently proposed in Wisconsin. Another approach to manipulate elections is to emphasize the years in which staggered terms are decided. This is certainly not a trivial matter, as in the United States Senate. We will hear an analysts highlight which states have relatively safe incumbents running, such as in Washington, where there are likely to be swings in the electorate, West Virginia, and where the contest is uncertain. Arizona, Montana, and Ohio are currently listed as toss-ups by 270 to win. Control of the Senate will likely hinge on these races. However, I find that cartographers who are managing voting so closely that they are assessing the even versus odd number districts or whether the districts are voted on during the presidential year or the gubernatorial year to be another form of manipulation. These Texas maps from Dave's redistricting notable maps demonstrate again how many different ways there are to draw electoral districts that address all traditional redistricting criteria, but likely lead to different results. How soon a new map with new districts is used does matter then for the voters in say electing state senators in Wisconsin, but probably not as much as having reasonable districts. In El Paso County, Colorado, there was a great deal of discussion about the change, um, about the challenge of moving district precincts into new districts, which meant that some people might be voting for county commissioner twice in four years, where some other voters would be waiting for six years to cast a ballot. During one of the public hearings, a community member noted that the staggered terms mattered very little. It was much more important to draw the lines so that neighborhoods and communities were kept whole rather than divided. Also, except for very active members of the electorate, sadly, most people are unable to identify their representatives on the various legislative bodies. With online mapping tools and multiple ways to communicate from the postal service to email, it is not difficult to figure out which voting district you reside in, even if it changes. For a start, check the Colorado General Assembly website. The more important question, in my opinion, is understanding with whom you are voting, as well as being aware of important issues and opportunities in your community. The individuals who have managed court cases, developed independent redistricting commissions, and shown up to ask the legislative representatives why they have drawn the map the way a certain way, exemplify Justice Frankfurter's declaration that, quote, the performance of many duties in our governmental scheme depend on the vigilance of the people in exercising their political rights. Just recently, we can salute the Wisconsin Fair Maps Coalition which assured maps to elect a representative and balanced legislature were passed by the state and signed by the governor. The North Carolina citizens and chapter of the NAACP who identified districts that are drawn carefully so that quote, preferred candidates of black voters lose to candidates backed by white voters, unquote. And the people in Ohio who are collecting signatures to add an amendment to replace the current politician run redistricting process with a citizen led commission required to create fair state legislative and congressional districts through a more open and independent system to the ballot this fall. Despite misconceptions, gerrymandering is not redistricting. We know there is significant effort devoted to gerrymandering in order to win elected positions. Richard Murrell, the eminent political geographer, wrote in 1987, why is extreme irregularity prima facie suspect? The answer, why else would anyone go to considerable effort? Frankly, no one should be going to so much effort, either to create gerrymandered maps or to have to monitor them. Remember, all this work to draw fair maps is really to address ways to ensure that elected officials represent the people reflect the people they represent. As John Adams wrote in 1776, quote, the representative assembly should be an exact portrait in miniature of the people at large, as it should think, feel, reason, and act like them. 
Great care should be taken in the formation of it to prevent unfair, partial, and corrupt elections. That it may be the interest of this assembly to do equal right and strict justice upon all occasions. It should be an equal representation of their constituents, or in other words, equal interests among the people should have equal interests in the representative body." Unquote. Thinking about the people with whom you are voting provides an opportunity to consider the connections between geography and legislative action. Are you in a competitive district or one where people mostly share your perspective? Does that change how you approach your elected officials? These maps of Colorado legislative and congressional districts were drawn by two independent citizen redistricting commissions. Whether you agree or disagree with how the final maps look, the process allowed for a great deal of public participation and input. The Colorado Supreme Court determined that while different maps could have been drawn that satisfied the requirements, the current maps were reasonable and adhered to amendments Y and Z. The overall grade is pretty good. Although the state could score higher on the geographic features due to the compactness of districts and having quote, more county splits than typical. We are spoiled here in Colorado when compared with many other states that make public participation difficult. Hearings might only be announced a day or so ahead and channels for public comment are mysterious. Here are a variety of notable maps for Colorado from Dave's redistricting. Again, you can see how different they look. They highlight the kinds of choices that would have to be made to meet particular criteria. And remember that even if the number of representatives remains the same following the 2030 census, the lines will need to be redrawn because of internal migration. I had hoped that everyone in the country would find redistricting such a fascinating topic that they would create their own maps, mm -hmm. illustrated by this tool from Districter. But unless you include redistricting mapping as part of a civics or history, geography, or political science class, only the rare individual will explore the process. It is hard to make maps. But once you have experienced drawing a map, you're much better able to assess the choices others make in drawing a new map or revising an old one. This is a great deal of information. So I return to GeoCivics, which offers open source state-based resources to educators, students, and community members so that they can ask useful questions about the redistricting process and outcomes. Understand the US Census and the process for apportionment redistricting. Consider how a state's population has migrated over time. Propose general options for dividing a state into electoral districts. For example, east versus west, north, south, uh, group people by rural or urban areas or by watershed. Know about redistricting for the jurisdiction where the map is being drawn, including who is responsible for managing the process, what the criteria are, and how the public can be involved. What are the rules for drawing the lines? Are they different depending on the jurisdiction being divided? District lines happen at multiple scales and local elections have significant impact on people's daily lives. Some states have described their redistricting bodies as independent, but unless at least some members of, are chosen randomly, political influence dominates. Pay attention to the rules. Consider how to prioritize key criteria for drawing electoral districts. What is your rationale? Explain your community by describing characteristics and drawing it on a map. What historical precedents and economic and political interests should be taken into account? With whom are you voting? Think about your neighbors. How would you describe your district? Competitive, cohesive, proportional? Explain what is important in your community. Remember that members of the redistricting team do not know as much about the area as you do. You do not have to be a public policy expert to explain your situation and what your concerns are. This example from the Denver City Council redistricting process illustrates a number of communities of interest that were analyzed and combined during the redistricting process. The landscape had improved dramatically from locked rooms with unintelligible mapping software in, in decades past, but this still means that people must take time to learn about how geospatial technology works. Create your own electoral districts using free online mapping tools. 
in 2016, there were very few accessible online mapping platforms, but by the time maps were drawn in 21, multiple organizations had established tools and tutorials for anyone with a computer to create a district map with limitations. I expect these tools to continue to improve and become more intuitive and useful in coming redistricting cycles. A variety of online open source mapping tools using 2020 data guides participants through creating electoral districts, such as, uh, here's an example from Michigan. Critique existing maps using information gained by learning about the process and by making maps yourself. The best maps provide context. What's interesting about this map and how will it affect other criteria are great questions. Maps currently are usually much more accessible than they were when they were drawn by hand. Discuss how maps represent the population with family, friends, neighbors, and colleagues. Try to keep the conversations you have nonpartisan. Everyone should be interested in fair representation through fair districts. In 1964, Andrew Hacker wrote, the real problem is not to secure more liberal or conservative legislation, but to give full representation to all Americans, how they will want to use their power, what kind of congressman they will elect, what will be the ultimate legislative outcome. These are important questions, but they should not affect the overriding issue of equal votes for equal citizens. To my great disappointment, the do-it-yourself redistricting craze never really caught on. Reporters across the country chose to engage with electoral district maps from a variety of perspectives, usually focusing on the potential outcome of an election, although occasionally offering assessment about how communities are grouped together or split apart. In a democracy, we should strive for transparency, rationally, and predictability. This is a decimetric dot density poster of the 2020 U.S. presidential election by Kenneth Field, where one dot equals one vote. Data at a county level has been reapportioned to urban areas and dots are positioned randomly. We will be looking at these electoral maps a great deal during the coming year. And we need to be sure that we are prepared to use words with meaning when we speak with each other, avoiding coded language and rhetoric. There is a time and a place for political rhetoric, but it is not when sitting around a table discussing where to draw electoral district lines. As members of the Rocky Mountain Map Society, I know you are predisposed to a discussion about how redistricting maps are created. But my call today is to engage you as citizens into active participation in redistricting processes at all levels. I hope that I have provided you with a variety of tools to consider the role of electoral districts that will enable you, your colleagues, friends, and family to persevere through what will likely be a challenging election season. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Please define the term splitting. Splitting. Happy to do that. Uh, let's see if I can add a visual. Sorry. Um, so splitting is when you have a district that might seem whole, like for instance, um, the city of Denver. Uh, if there was a particular rationale for dividing the city of Denver and linking it up with rural areas um, so that the votes of people who lived in Denver might be diluted. Um, so um, you can see here in the bottom right hand, it says the least splitting. So when, they, when they're talking about that in terms of these sample maps, um, it is the least splitting of some kind of political entity, usually a county or a city or a municipality. And the splitting means you're doing it deliberately as a way to disenfranchise people who live in that particular area. So the example that I was looking for was the Davidson County. So Davidson County is Nashville. Davidson County and Nashville are one political entity. And there used to be one member of Congress who represented that area. And what the people in, who were drawing the lines in Tennessee did was to split Nashville into three different congressional districts. So the people who live in Nashville, who are primarily more liberal, uh, vote Democratic, are then kind of subsumed into more Republican and more conservative areas. So that's splitting. 
you showed this this page several times these five criteria. Yeah. And I wonder if you could talk about so which of these criteria are deemed the most useful or the best, and which of these are criteria that we don't generally use or oh. Yeah, and and that's a great question. I'm wondering, can you fix this so it's so we don't have this on the top? I accidentally did. You better that. repeat the question. For I will do that. Good point. Just trying to get the top. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the question is, uh, since I have yes, you could tell that I really liked Dave's redistricting app because what we're seeing these different maps are taken from what the people who curate Dave's redistricting app, these are all um, ones that people out in the country have submitted. And then somebody goes through and says, okay, this is the most proportional. So in terms of what's the best, it depends on what your objective is. And that's why I step back and say, start that first do have the conversation about what is most important to you. You must have equal population. You must not disenfranchise minorities, right? So that's the constitution. But then if you say the most important thing to me is to not split communities, then that would be your, your next determination. You also have to have, everything has to be contiguous, meaning that you could not have a district that was in the northeastern corner connected with the southeastern corner and there wasn't a connection between them. You have to have a physical connection. The exceptions for that are islands. So, so that's your choice, right? That's the conversation that you have to have about what's important. If minority representation was important, then we also have what looks like weird looking districts in Colorado. Right, so um, what's not in here in, in these particular um, options are historic districts. So taking in, keeping in mind how a district has looked over time. So I may not be understanding the least splitting mm -hmm. option because like I'm looking at the light purple, which is where I live, live in the northeast corner of that. <clears throat> what do I have in common with the people of Durango? It's great question. Exactly. So, so what this map is telling you is that if what's most important to you is to not split political boundaries, this is the best map for that. But again, you're working with multiple criteria. Mm -hmm. And so it these are examples of kind of the extreme maps for each of these criteria. Um, they aren't necessarily the best map because frankly, none of these were chosen right. by the Colorado Redistricting Commission. Question, pardon my ignorance on this because I found this very confusing, especially coming from a different country. <laughs> um, and you mentioned that things like this happen in other countries, but when you have countries with popular vote, that they don't have electoral college. Does this matter at all? Mm. So I did not talk a lot about the electoral college um, because that's, um, it really has more to do with apportionment. So how many, um, that changes in terms of the number of representatives that each state has. So this is much more um, a question of how are you as a person who resides somewhere and a citizen who can vote, how are you being represented in your legislative body? Whether it's the city council, the state legislature or the Congress. So how does that, how does that group of people get represented? And in many countries, it's geographic. In some countries, it's not. It's, it's by uh, proportional representation by party. So there can be places that are not um, looking at geographic representation at all. So does- But this affects the representatives, right? How they're elected by how you it, draw this map. It affects not the senators, but the representatives. So the senators are, are elected geographically, but by the whole state. So 
one can also talk about the malapportionment in terms of representation in the Senate, where uh, small states um, have equal vote to large to states that are populated that, that are highly populated. So that's disparate. Um, but in terms of the electoral college, it's it's challenging to think about places like. There, you have Wyoming with three electoral college votes, and you have Vermont with three electoral college votes. I would argue that the conservative Wyoming and liberal Vermont, you know, are kind of balancing each other out. Um, but it does make a difference in terms of uh, the electoral college as to where the population lives. I don't know if this is a bad question, but just because you seem immersed in this. Has there been any discussion of like changing, I'm thinking Wyoming, right? Wyoming has one representative. Let's assume that's the smallest number of people per representative. Is there any move to like readjust everybody else so they all have like 400,000 people per congressional district or however many Wyoming has? Yes, so the question is, is there some movement to change how we, the, the number, right, how we reallocate really uh, the representatives. Um, so yes, there has been. Nobody really wants to change the 435 members at this point, although there have been suggestions to do that. Um, so if you go back to um, the beginning of the constitution, uh, the representatives in Congress were representing about 30,000 people. So that's quite different than the 700 something thousand that we're representing today. And yes, what is fascinating to look at is in Delaware, I think it's 900,000 people are represented by one individual simply because of this process for distributing the representatives. Um, the Census Bureau has an excellent video on um, the system of apportionment. So if, if you want to go and look that up, you're welcome to do that. Um, so yes, there are all kinds of options. And that's why I wanted to highlight uh, the conversation about democracy reforms is because redistricting, in my view, is something that people can kind of get a hold of. It's, and it's something that you could make fairer within the current process, changing, how we group people together outside of that is offers more opportunity, but there are definitely people putting out those um, those proposals. During the political process of determining the criteria that goes into something like most competitive category, uh, what would be some of that? some of that uh, specific data that we can have, like age, race. Sure, so the question was about how you would determine most competitive. So a good example of that is what just happened in El Paso County for the commissioner districts. The clerk and recorder's office was asked to provide uh, voting data trends over time uh, to see um, who voted for what, and, and they were doing it by precinct. Uh, was the process. So you could look back at the last three or four cycles of presidential elections, which, which way did that precinct vote? Um, and also at statewide um, elections um, to see, again, you know, are, are you voting for uh, the Republican or the Democratic candidate? Um, you can look a little bit at uh, voter registration as well in those precincts to see what the competitive level is. And of course, now because we have a, such a high percentage of people who are regist not registering at all or registering for another party, right? That gives a whole other perspective about what competitiveness means. Although we're still really still looking at the Democrat versus Republican um, races, but that's what the competitiveness conversation is. In terms of other demographic characteristics, that plays more into communities of interest, which are not displayed here on these maps because communities of interest are much more nebulous and very difficult for uh, people to define. Um, you can 
define minority representation. Right? So if you look at the map there in the upper right hand corner, you can see that the pink um, uh, district probably includes a lot of Hispanics. So if you think about the demographics of the state, um, that would be saying, okay, this this district would you know be likely to be able to represent or to elect a Hispanic member of Congress if they wanted to do that. So there are incorporating a great deal of data is definitely something that the um, that the redistricting commission would do. Yes, the, um, the house is capped at four thirty five. That was like in the 1920s. No, the, the question is, when was the House capped at 435? It was uh, 1911. 1911, okay. But do you have, you know, in your, all of your studies and such, what was their rationale for doing that? Uh, it, I, I have not come, I'm sure there is one. I have not come across the exact um, assessment of that but I've got a couple books that we could look at in, in the back and see, but no, that's a great question. Um, and what has been interesting in my reading, and I'm not really a historical, um, I, I don't do a lot of historical analysis, although uh, Julia Jackson and I did write a piece for the History Colorado Magazine a couple of years ago, on looking at how the congressional districts evolved. So that's kind of interesting. Um, it's just, they said, well, you know, we have these states and now we're and territories and now we're going to add a new one and they're going to get a new representative. So they just kept adding them. So nobody had to be upset that they're, they were being taken away. And then suddenly when that occurred, that, that was really the time when people started to get crabby um, and, and to make some, um, some significant arguments about why they should maintain their uh, their number of representatives. To follow up on your question, I had a long conversation with our previous representative before we lost him because he was no longer in District 2. District 2 is that big green blob on the left-hand side. You're talking Westminster, Broomfield, Boulder, Firestone, Fort Collins, all the rural areas and everything up to the northwest. And he said, even if I could be able to, I would not be able to govern something that's that where I go. I'm invited to people's homes to talk to them, invited to their city council meetings, and all the things that I, as a representative, I am your eyes and your ears. And he said, this is impossible. So he retired. Mm -hmm. So, and we're very unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the challenge is, how does one um, represent a, a district both large in area and diverse? And and that is absolutely a, a major question. So um, if you look at uh, somebody, I could go to the to the current map. Oops, or not. We're going to leave it right here. Uh, but if you think of the current map of congressional, you're talking about congressional districts. Um, but right, the whole eastern, all the eastern plains, right, are is one district, and that, <laughs> and and the idea of splitting that north and uh, or east and west, you could, right? But it also really makes sense that that is. In itself, a community of interest. There are people there. Uh, you know, they they are farmers and ranchers. Um, there are small towns which have very different needs than the urban areas along the Front Range. So the the most sometimes the the maps where you think, oh, we should have a competitive district that would be better. Is that necessarily true? Right, because then the people on the Eastern Plains would be really, as, as your representative is noting, is trying to figure out how would I represent all of these different interests. On the other hand, competitive districts do have their uh, value in terms of saying, we want to make sure that this diverse group of people is talking to each other. 
And that's what I was trying to say earlier is think about with whom you're voting. Maybe you have to reach out to those people a little bit more and try to find where those commonalities are. Um, at one of the Colorado redistricting commission meetings, somebody from Boulder stood up and said, oh, just don't put me with those people from Weld County. What are we and I'm like, you really need to talk to those people, right? Mm -hmm. So that there, there is a reason for having conversation. So I think it's a balance. Your question earlier was what are the most important criteria? What do you want to consider? And the answer is it depends. Um, and there was a map that was presented that split Colorado Springs. And I thought that that was not a useful map. It would have added um, that the intent was to add a Hispanic representative, but I thought that giving up the Colorado Springs political, um, so, so it would, this is this least splitting conversation. Um, I, I didn't think personally that that was a good idea. So maybe somebody could have convinced me of that. But um, again, I thought I think it's better to have kept that those entities together. And as you can see in most of these maps, that weird um, configuration of Denver plus the airport, that's what makes this look so strange. Those are almost always contained together so that they are not split. Well, thank you so much for clarifying that. Getting us this, we'll, this will go on and on, <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, and uh, hope to see you, everybody, uh, next month for uh, Don McGurk's uh, interesting. We're going to go back to way into the what the 1600s or even or 1500s uh, for uh, how redistricting was going on on the Americas back then. <laughs> Thank you so much.